Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Varshini Prakash, and I am the executive director for Sunrise, as well as one of the co-founders. I'm based in Boston. And um, for those of you who don't know, Sunrise Movement is building a movement of young people to help shift the course of this country towards a more just, equitable, and safer planet, economy, and society. And we are building political power to stop climate change and secure economic prosperity and social and, and racial equity for all through a Green New Deal. So thank you so much for tuning in. I know we are in the midst of a pandemic and I am sending prayers to you and yours and, and hoping that you are all healthy and safe, although I know that is super not the reality for so many among us right now. Um, but I'm glad to be on this panel right now because I will say this incredible group of women gives me so much hope in these times. Um, so thank you for joining us. And this is gonna be a discussion about the fight for a Green New Deal during COVID-19. Um, thousands of people in this country have died because of this pandemic. We are seeing those numbers disproportionately affecting black communities, um, poor and working class communities. We are watching our president dangerously ignoring doctors, science, scientists, which is not at all unlike how he has acted with the climate crisis and environmental injustice. Um, and we have seen in which the, 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 the COVID-19 crisis has just absolutely laid bare all of the existing inequalities in our system. And at the same time, it's also abundantly clear that we have not paused the clock on climate, right? Scientists are predicting that we will have massive hurricanes this year. It is set up to be the, the fifth hottest year on, in, in, on record in human history. There are still injustices where people don't have access to clean air and clean water. So we need a Green New Deal. We need a mass social and economic program that meets this moment. That means this crisis as well as crises to come. And we're here to talk about how the Green New Deal could be one of the core solutions that we need to lift us out of the impending recessions and possible depressions, to put people back to work, not in jobs with no benefits that pay minimum wage or less, but good jobs that do the vital work of moving us towards a renewable energy economy and help us weather the storm and, and the storms to come, literally. So a brief intro to the panelists, we have Emma Lockridge, who is an environmental justice organizer for Michigan United, which organizes to build the power that communities need to win the justice that they deserve, and are working for a, an equitable world that reflects our values of economic and racial justice. And Emma is based in Detroit, Michigan. Thanks for being here, Emma. Um, I want to introduce Lenore Friedlander who is the assistant to the president in SEIU 32BJ and on the Environmental Justice Committee. Um, and she oversees a lot of amazing strategic partnership with at 32BJ that is building really strong alliances with labor, clergy, um, advocacy partners, but partners both locally, regionally, nationally, and also internationally. And then we have Naomi Klein, who is a journalist and a New York Times bestselling author. Um, author of The Shock Doctrine, which is uh, very resonant in this moment, and a co-founder of TheLeak.org, and she currently teaches at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And last but certainly not least, we have Rihanna Gunwright, who is the Director of Climate Policy at the Roosevelt Institute. And before joining Roosevelt, uh, Rihanna was the Policy Director for New Consensus, who was charged with developing and promoting the Green New Deal, amongst other socioeconomic projects. Welcome everybody. So um, I want to talk for the first half of this conversation about, you know, what is the problem? Like, how have you seen the crisis around COVID-19 sort of illuminate the structural challenges and inequities in our society and economy? And how are you seeing the current coronavirus impacts really relate to an overlap with uh, the climate crisis and our environmental issues that we have as well. And I'm thinking I might start, I would love to hear specifically about the impacts on workers and environmental justice communities. So maybe we can start with Emma and Lenore first and then go to Rihanna and Naomi. Well, good afternoon. Um, I live in Detroit 48217. It is the most polluted zip code in the entire state of Michigan. We have over 29 polluting facilities that ring 
our community that includes a huge tar sands oil refinery, an auto industry uh, that makes the F uh, Ford 150. We have utilities, all kinds of things, 49,000 tons of uh, pollution dropped on us every year. And for us, it's been a pollution pandemic. That's what we've been suffering through. When people went out to purchase masks, when this first happened, I already had a box in my house. I have a box of masks in my house because there are so many nights where I can't sleep in my own home because of the odors, the toxins that come through my windows and everywhere, just come into my home and at night I can't sleep. So I literally sleep in a mask in my house. So now the rest of the society is getting to see what we've been going through, that unseen thing, you can't even see it. You can't see the pollution oftentimes, but you know, you feel it in your body and you know it's killing you. Detroit, uh, my community is, has taken such a major hit. Uh, one of my closest environmental justice friends, I called her to work with me last week or, or three weeks ago, she had just been diagnosed. Since then, she's had kidney failure, she's come out the hospital, with kidney failure, she is now in rehab trying to learn to walk again. My neighbor up the street, 50 years old, dead. My neighbor three blocks over, she had sarcoidosis, which is a disease of the lungs already. And they don't even know the cause of this disease. But I tell you what, I do, it's pollution. Because four people on her street had that same disease. She died. My state representative, who lives only a few more blocks from me, just got out the hospital. He died. Detroiters make up 14% of the population in Detroit. We are 41% of the cases. In fact, they're saying now that we have had more people die of COVID, 538 people in the city of Detroit than all of the gunshots added up for two years. And people know Detroit is no, no, that's that violent place. COVID has been way more violent to our community. When I look on Facebook, at night, it's a rolling obituary. It's, it's very painful to even open it up because so many people have died. We are just dying here. And now in my community, we now know that we have at least 76 people who have COVID. But they're saying for every one person, there are probably 10 people who have been near them who could possibly have it, which takes it up to 760. And then if you think about those people, we are, fighting for our lives here. This is the, it's so dangerous. It's so frightening. It's so related to the environment because Harvard now says that all of this pollution is related to the cases that we're catching here of this disease and other people are starting to connect the dots. And so this is a wake up call. Everything has to change. Everything has to change because COVID is taking us out. It is taking us out. We have had to have changed the way we work, even in our organizing, to give people days to grieve. Because people keep coming on our calls at Michigan United in tears. And then we have to have moments of silence because so many people are dying. And that's what we're going through right here in Detroit, Michigan, in Detroit 48217. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that, Emma. I felt that really deeply. Wow. And I know, I mean, <clears throat> I know, Lenore, it's been a very similar story for a lot of your workers as well, you know, seeing like nurses on the front line. And, and also, I know you have a lot of workers in these communities, like we actually organized together with Sunrise and SEIU in Detroit, uh, a, you know, just a year ago. Um, can you share a little bit about what's happening in your community? Sure. Thank you, Varshini. And um, it's great to be on this panel. Um, and just for those who may not know, SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, has about 2 million members in the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico. SEIU members work in healthcare and hospitals and nursing homes and home care. They work for municipal and state governments and public services. And um, that, uh, hundreds of thousands also work in property services, cleaning, maintenance, and security, um, and all types of buildings and at airports. And um, for those of us in New York City, um, our SEIU locals, including 32BJ, but also 1199 and other SEIU locals, have lost many, many members to this disease. 
many of our members are essential workers going to work on the front lines every single day, whether they're in healthcare, whether they're working as a, as a door person or building superintendent, whether they're working providing security in an office building, whether they're in airports. Um, and they're risking, they're putting their health and their family's health on the front line, um, putting at risk every single day going to work. We have members who are walking to work because they're afraid to take the public transportation in the subway because they don't want to be around other people. We have members, um, we've had to tell members there's a shortage of masks in this country and the priority is for healthcare workers and how horrible is it to have that conversation. Uh, we have members where, who work um, alongside somebody who passed away and they're fearful of going back to work the next day, but yet they know they have a job to provide a service um, to, t to the tenants or residents of the building, um, or in the case of healthcare workers, they have to keep going um, because so many people's lives are at stake. So I think one of the points that you made, Varshini, in, in the beginning, that this crisis has made it so clear the structural injustice and inequity in our society. Nobody can shy away from the fact that we live in a society with incredible uh, polarization and injustice, incredible uh, difference in wealth and power in this country. Um, those are things that we deal with every day in the labor movement and, and our colleagues and comrades in the racial justice and immigrant justice uh, movement and indigenous peoples movements also deal with every day is we struggle against that imbalance in power and wealth. When you think about, there's a lot of talk about essential workers or hourly workers. How many of those people don't make $15 an hour? How many of those workers do not have health insurance, yet they're exposing themselves and their families um, every single day? How many, um, you know, are struggling paycheck to paycheck uh, just, to, just to try to survive? So there's been a lot more talk about hourly workers, um, but it really, you know, we should be thinking about, well, what really, what kind of pay and benefits should all workers really have? What should be the minimum? There's no reason that um, as part of this recovery that we're not talking about and fighting for a higher minimum wage. $15 an hour, that's not even a place to start really, but it's double what the federal minimum wage is right now. So we have to think about and recognize, you know, the, the work that people on the front lines do. That is, people who pick up our trash, the people in the grocery stores, the delivery people, the people in food processing plants, healthcare workers, our members, um, and so many more who um, make this society go and are so critical in terms of um, what it really takes. Um, and when we, you know, it's right to recognize doctors and nurses, but we also got to think about the people who wash the sheets and the people who cook the food and the people who clean the rooms and the people in the labs and everybody who's important in a hospital. They're all a necessary part and they all deserve credit uh, for working day and night to, to um, try to make sure that people survive it and pull through. We know that uh, over 22 million people have filed for unemployment in this, in this country. That is an underestimate because, you know, undocumented people uh, aren't going to file for unemployment. Gig workers aren't necessarily going to file for unemployment, depending on the state, if they're eligible. Some states like New York, there have been um, some uh, increased opportunities for non-traditional uh, workers to file for and receive public benefits, but there's still whole categories of workers who are excluded. And the idea that a one-time, you know, check, maybe if somebody can get their hands on a $1,200 check for, you know, that doesn't even... Uh, begin to cover the kinds of things that people have and uh, you know many undocumented workers are ineligible for that money. So you know we have to, th to think about what it really means that millions and millions of people are out of work with no ability to go back to work and for some people without the ability to um, benefit from some of the public programs right. and, and the public programs are important to support people who are out of work um, but they don't reach everybody. Totally. Uh, and just one other point that I think is important that I think Emma touched on also that the COVID-19 attacks the respiratory system. And so many working class communities and communities of color have higher rates of asthma or near contaminated land. 
People, you know, don't have uh, clean or healthy water or air to breathe. And those factors and people, uh, many uh, working class people also don't have access to quality health care. And so those factors also uh, take a huge toll in working class communities. And I guess I just had one other uh, kind of point on this. I think this moment also shows the importance of government and the attacks by right wingers to say that, you know, to shrink government or the government should only benefit large corporations. This is a moment where we see more clearly than ever that government has a really important role in providing for the, uh, for the common good. And we need government to work right. on behalf of working class people, uh, working class communities, communities of color, indigenous people in a way that uh, creates uh, equality and justice. Yeah. That's exactly right. Thank you so much, Emma and Lenore. I feel like that was just such a clear and lucid illustration of the connection between, you know, who faces the greatest pollution, who faces the greatest effects from climate disaster and environmental injustice, and who faces the greatest threats from corona, who has to work in times of crisis and is now considered an essential worker where previously they weren't and didn't have adequate wages, etc. Um, I feel like the question that you asked at the end, Lenore, was just a really great segue into some of the things that Naomi and Brianna have been thinking about. Um, curious if either of you want to start on that question that Lenore left us off with, which is, you know, what is the role of government in times of crisis? Like, what does sort of the the, the response, the recovery, the reimagination of our economic policy and these broad ideas around what society can be and who it should be for. Can you all share a little bit of that and how the Green New Deal might fit into that picture? Um, sure. So um, when I think about what is going on right now, um, like Lenore and Emma said, and, and you said, Barsh, uh, this has laid sort of the inequities in our system very bare. Um, which is incredibly true. And when I think of sort of how we got here or why, um, <laughs> it's weird, but I, I think of Tiger King a lot. And I don't know if you remember, if you saw Tiger King, there is a part where uh, Carol Baskin uh, goes in her closet and all she wears is animal print. Like all she wears is animal print. And that's like the U.S. except you take out animal print and put in like neoliberalism and white supremacy <laughs> and like sexism. Uh, and the issue is that um, part of what has happened is that these are threads that have run through um, our policymaking, particularly since uh, over the last 40 years. Um, that have really run through our policy making. And it's been sort of the through line in our systems. Um, but the fact is that um, that through line created a really unequal um, system. And I think there was this idea that somehow, and it wasn't everywhere, obviously, uh, people who suffer from these systems have very clear criticisms and were very clear about where uh, they went wrong. Um, but I think in the wider sort of conversation, there was this idea that somehow um, we could outrun all of it, right? Like um, you can build an incredibly unequal economy, but still have it be great, right? Have a very strong economy, quote unquote. Um, you can have um, deep voter suppression, largely on racial lines and still have a functioning democracy. And I think that what we saw, which a lot of people already knew, is that these deeply unequal systems don't work and they are incredibly vulnerable in times of crisis um, because they require a very sort of limited set of conditions to function, right? They require um, that it's okay to poison some people without repercussion, right? They require um, that it is possible to sort of separate wages from the health of corporations. They require all of these things that actually uh, change the metrics, but don't actually change the outcome. So you're not getting better outcomes. You're just measuring different things. You're measuring how the stock market goes when you're talking about how the economy is working. You're measuring um, 
sort of this like really deep focus on red and blue and sort of ignoring voter suppression. And I think um, this moment is making it very clear that sort of the same things that made us vulnerable to Corona are the exact same things that have made progress on climate so difficult, right? Um, even if you just think about COVID and the response, like that was possible because we elected someone like Trump, which was possible because in part of voter suppression, right? And we also know that those voters are the voters that are most inclined to vote on climate, right? Our people of color, our African-American folks and Latinx folks, and those are the people who are not you know, allowed to sort of have the same voice in our democracy. And I think what we're seeing is a, is we talk a lot about trickle down economics, but trickle down sort of vulnerability and oppression is a really um, real thing. And it has created these, um, these very clear um, sort of issues that now we have to face at the same time as these same strands are kind of constraining the political ability to face this. Yeah, totally. Do you have, I mean, would you share anything about just like what the solution around this stuff is and kind of the role of the Green New Deal and all of that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, we're looking at, no one knows the depth of the recession that's coming, right? Um, but we know that, like Lenore said, there's 22 million people out of work, more that aren't captured, right, in unemployment measures. And it is very unlikely that overnight all of those people are going to get their jobs back, right? Mm -hmm. There are some amount of jobs that will not come back. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, along with some other things, looks like we're facing a we could be facing a pretty deep uh, recession. Um, and the interesting thing why the Green New Deal fits is because when you think about sort of the drastic dip in demand, the only thing that sort of has the same amount of scale in terms of what's needed is climate, right? Um, we are, we have to do so much to uh, reduce emissions that quite frankly, it's the best path. It's one of the most promising paths forward, if not the best path forward, for an economic recovery long term. So that's the role of the Green New Deal, uh, which is that at once you can both sort of um, provide this spike in demand that we need to have a long term economic recovery and at the same time decarbonize. And again, because the Green New Deal is really focused on the nexus between equity and jobs and the environment there's a big focus on how you do that in ways that actually empowers the working class. Right. So the Green New Deal actually allows us sort of, it's not as easy as it sounds, but sort of in one fell swoop, quote unquote, to deal with a lot of these interconnected issues and to deal with them as though they are actually connected and not uh, in these sort of silo ways where let's deal with Corona and then right. let's deal with climate and then let's deal with whatever, as though we actually are in some sort of linear time right. line, right. Um, and that there aren't competing priorities and whatnot. Um, and but, I think it, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Rihanna. I mean, I feel like, <laughs> no, that was awesome. And I feel like, you know, balancing the whatever short-term relief with the long-term recovery of what all of this looks like, we can't just, as you know, as I said at the beginning, we cannot just pause the clock on climate and act like it's our world isn't still burning up in front of us, right? Um, Naomi, I'm wondering if you can uh, if you can kind of continue on this tip around like what the solutions are in the Green New Deal as part of that, and if you can sort of like also weaving in some of these concepts around the shock doctrine and and how the right is using that right now, and also how we can. Yeah, um, absolutely. And this has been am amazing to listen to these incredible women. Um, and, you know, the, the last time we I, I saw each other in person, I think Varshini was in late September, maybe. Um, and, you know, I had just done the, like this, this book about the need for a Green New Deal, right? And, and we did the tour, I did the tour with Sunrise and, and met with Sunrise activists in lots of cities across the US. And that was the best part of it, honestly. Um, but doing that put me in touch with like, 
both the amount of energy that's out there for, for this vision, right, of, of fighting inequality, fighting injustice, fighting poverty, fighting racism, fighting gender exclusion, and solving the climate crisis at the same time, or to the extent that we can still solve it. Um, and there's lots of excitement, right, um, among young people um, in particular. But there's also skepticism, particularly among sort of their, the quote unquote serious, you know, elites in this country. And, and so in having those conversations about um, why we need a Green New Deal, you come up against the arguments around, gosh, isn't it too much? Gosh, isn't it too fast, right? Um, and, 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 you know, in, in, and in having these debates, and I know we've all had them in various forms, right? You know, I would often talk about um, moments in American history where th this country moved very quickly. And yes, left many people out, but if we look at the original New Deal, if we look at the, the Marshall Plan after the Second World War, if we look at, at, at these periods um, uh, in the US and US policy in other countries, these were big changes, right? And we need to, you know, I was arguing we need to take the lessons that we can move quickly and we also need to take the warnings of who was left out and who was excluded. But the argument that I came up most against was, yeah, but that was the Great Depression. That was the Dust Bowl. That was the Second World War. And here we are in a time of supposedly um, booming economy, low unemployment. And then you make the arguments that you know, Rihanna was just making. What does it mean to have a great economy when you have injustice baked into it at every level? Um, but the fact is that we can't point to moments of rapid, far-reaching, fundamental transformation in every aspect of society, as to quote the IPCC report, right, um, in the absence of crisis. Uh, and this is, frankly, I think what we saw during the, the primaries um, was that sort of feeling of like, well, after Trump, do we really want to do something really big or do we want to go maybe a little slower, right? Um, and we all heard those arguments while we were out there with our respective candidates, right? Um, and the fact is, in a crisis like this, we have to go big. Like, as Rihanna just said, we need solutions at the scale of the crisis. We have been making that argument about th that with that climate requires solutions on that scale for a long time. Um, but the fact is, it was not a crisis that was hitting people's daily lives simultaneously in the same way as this crisis is, right? So we have this challenge of staying on emergency footing, um, but at simultaneously not allowing political leaders to abuse that state of emergency to um, do what I've called the shock doctrine or disaster capitalism. And this is the problem, which brings us to Lenora's question. What should the role of government be? Well, there's our, our, our there's the, the role of the government we don't have and would like to have. And that's all kinds of things that we've all been talking about, about around a Green New Deal. You know, when we wrote the LEAP Manifesto, we called it, um, you know, it's a, a call for an economy where we are caring for the planet and each other, right? And I think coming out of, um, of this crisis or, or you know, the lessons of, of the pandemic, we are seeing the centrality of caregivers. And, and I agree with Lenora that we need to expand the definition of who is a caregiver. It is, yes, it's doctors, yes, it's nurses, but it is also cleaners. It is also the people growing our food, right? Um, so we need, like, I think maybe it, if we're going to bring people along with the Green New Deal, we need to draw the lessons from this pandemic into that space really, really clearly, right? Like, what is an essential economy right now, right? Well, this is this moment where everyone's thinking about who is an essential worker? What is essential in my life? What can't I live without? We're all being um, confronted with these, kind of these questions. And I think that there's a way that maybe we can change how we talk about it and draw out some key lessons of this pandemic in, in showing the continuities. Wow, thank you, Naomi. You all are so brilliant. Thank you so much for being here. I cannot, that was like the fastest 30 minutes of my life. And I wish I had another hour with you all to talk because this is so critically important. I think the thing that one of the biggest things I'm taking away is this is life or death, y'all. Everything we're talking about is life or death. 
And if you're watching this and you're like, oh my God, I have to do something, I need to get involved. That is fantastic because every single one of the people here is part of an organization that you can join to help in this fight. Um, so join Sunrise Movement, join Michigan United if you live in Michigan or support them in some other way and uh, join or support organizations like SEIU. We need our labor folks out there um, and we need to be in solidarity with them. Um, ensure that, you know, check out theleaf.org and, and, and um, uh, fight for a just recovery across the country and in our communities and help us urge, you know, politicians at all levels of government to support a bailout for humans, for people, not corporations, and, you know, ensure that we have a just recovery and a Green New Deal. Um, so support each other, fight for a bailout for our people, not for corporations. And I want to ask every single one of our panelists to maybe share like one top line sentence that you want folks to take away um, today and what you think they should be looking out for. Maybe we'll start with Emma. Are you ready? Yeah, You're ready. ready. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just want to say normal wasn't working. And I want to echo what everyone else was saying. It wasn't working anyway because there were too many people suffering. And we need a quote unquote new norm. And that new norm, we can learn from some of the things that have already happened. We don't need millions of people driving to work every day. We need to start stay home, some of us. We don't need to take all that air travel. We can still work from these computers. It's so many other things we could do to stop extractive industries from destroying our planet. So let's look for that new norm. Everybody wants to get back to where we were. I'm not trying to go back there. I'm trying to go forward. Thank you, Emma. Let's maybe go to Naomi. I'm just going up my screen. Naomi, Lenore, and then Rihanna. Oh, that was so perfect. Um, <laughs> I guess just building on that, you know, and, and what I was saying earlier about we need to bring draw the lessons from, 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 from this crisis in how we deal with the climate crisis. And, and one, one of the things that I feel really strongly and that I know everybody who I know feels really strongly is we miss each other. Uh -huh. um, yeah, there's a lot that we can do with our screens, but there's a lot we can't do, right? Um, and, and, and we need to be in deeper connection with each other and also with the natural world because it, one of the things that is giving us solace right now is, is, is nature, is, is the fact that, you know, amidst all of this, it is still spring. Um, and, and, and in so many ways, I think, uh, you know, we, uh, capitalism uh, gives us, it, it trains us to see us, ourselves as disconnected from each other and from the natural world. And how we rebuild has to build on these revelations in this moment about our interconnection. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, let's go to Lenore. That was okay. I really like Naomi that that uh, your point about that we have to think big. I agree. I think this is a moment we have to think big. We have to dream big. We have to organize big. We have to act big. Um, we have to use this crisis as a as a way to reimagine our society um, around the values that we believe in. And I think the memory of those that we have lost, you know, should inspire us. Uh, to continue to fight to organize for justice. Wow, thank you. All of this is so good. And I'm going to pass it to Rihanna to close this out. Yeah, um, I would just say um, that we can redesign the way that our society and our economy works. For a long time, we've been told that you can't do um, this or that you just can't do it, it's not possible, right? Um, but I think what we're seeing right now, not only is it possible, is it possible to find the money? Is it possible to figure out how to do these things? Um, but that the things that we're seeing, whether it's um, racially disparate uh, deaths from coronavirus or um, deep environmental injustice, the injustices that we see are not natural. We created them. And so you can design a system that takes them out. It's true. Thank you, Rihanna. Thank you, everybody. That is the end of our panel. 